Welcome to another edition of Hit the Lights podcast. I've got a very special guest with me today. I have Sir Julian Young, IET president. How are you? Uh, Gary, I'm doing well. Thanks very much indeed. Um, nine months now into the presidency of being in the IET. So it's, uh, yeah, all good. Thank you. No, no, brilliant stuff. Um, I mean, would you be able to tell me a little bit about your your journey into the world of engineering? Oh, absolutely. Um, I like, I think, probably many children, certainly of my era, were not quite pre precisely certain what it is that we wanted to do. Um, Pre-internet, a long time ago, as yeah. you may imagine. I'm 60 years old now, so this will have been in the sort of about 1977, 1978, trying to determine what to do for GCSEs and A-levels in those days. And you get to meet the career master, who happened mm. to be my English teacher who did this in his spare time sort of thing. Right. And, um, you know, he sort of said, right, Julian, tell me a bit, a bit more about yourself. Um, and uh, we concluded that actually for the number of times that I was taking my bicycle apart and putting it back together again and helping others uh, repair their own bicycle that perhaps really what I ought to be is an engineer mm. um, and it sounds really silly but it's almost as simple as that um, uh, I must say also that my father uh, was trained as an aircraft technician uh, engines on propulsion and at the time was working at Heathrow though I have to say I didn't really know very much about what it was that he did but mm. I guess a bit of that rubbed off as well yeah yeah leached into your into your um, life I'm sure he was very happy you kept taking your bike apart yeah, <laughs> it was. Yeah. <laughs> um, so obviously, so touching on it, then wh where did you go from there? How how did you um, take the next steps into becoming an engineer? Sure. Well, I was the so I was the first person. Well, I did clearly the right um, then O levels, now GCSEs, and the right A levels. <clears throat> so I studied maths, physics, and design technology uh, for A levels, thinking that that was the route into university. Um, I was the first person in my family to stay for A-levels when, in fact, you know, the normal uh, age for leaving school was 16 years old. And uh, and also I was then the first person in my family to think about going to university. So I didn't think that my parents could really afford for all of that to happen. It all sounded quite expensive without really looking into it too much. It was pre-loans and so on, but it was still an expensive thing to do to go through academic study with no form of income. Mm. So I thought what I needed to do was gain a sponsorship. And so I wrote to a number of companies to ask if in fact they might sponsor me to go to university and then clearly work for them at the end of it. Um, I got, um, most people didn't respond at all. Uh, Rolls-Royce wrote back very nicely and said no, uh, but out of it all, I was offered a place and went through interviews and so on for the Royal Air Force and also for British Airways. Um, to do exactly the same course that I ended up doing, which was air transport engineering at the city, uh, then a, a separate university, now part of uh, London University or University of London. Um, and uh, I cannot tell you now why to this day I chose the Royal Air Force over British Airways. Mm. Um, I know uh, a lot of people, in fact, I'm going off to a 60th birthday party uh, in July with one of my colleagues who went to British Airways. Um, I always think that he's had far better holidays than ever I've done because he could get <laughs> standby holidays. He yeah. used to fly, I remember in his early years, off to New York just to buy a handful of CDs and fly back again. God, yeah. Uh, because he could and still probably save money actually on the price <laughs> then of CDs in New York compared to uh, downtown uh, where he was uh, living. Um, looking back on it, and I'm pretty certain that probably all of them have earned more than I've done over the over the years. But I've really enjoyed being in the Royal Air Force. The opportunities for working alongside large numbers of people, having very large responsibilities early on in one's career, uh, and I mean people responsibilities, mm -hmm. and and also a very strong operating output. You know, a set number of aircraft that need to be made serviceable every day to meet the flying program this week, next week, next month, next year. Um, and also the formal responsibility of being a military commander and therefore at times having to be a disciplinarian as well as clearly trying to get on with your workforce and make sure you get the most, the most out of them mm. in terms of motivating and um, encouraging and inspiring, hopefully. 
it, it you know I learned an enormous amount and indeed changing jobs as I have done certainly in the early years every 18 to 24 months was great experience in every single job uh, really built on the last one uh, such that um, you know by the fight by the end I time I left at after 40 years I thought I knew the Royal Air Force pretty well having done mm-hmm. most engineering jobs uh, or been involved in most across the board and um, and ended up being the chief engineer of the Royal Air Force for the last four and a half years. If I'd done it for a day, I would have been proud uh, yeah. to have done it for four and a half years. I look back and just think how lucky I was to have had that kind of um, opportunity and experience. No, definitely. Yeah. I mean, uh, to take it back to you know, your university years then. So what was it you, you studied at university? I did. I studied air transport engineering, which um, sounds a bit of an odd course, really. It was put together principally for British Airways, where what they were trying to do was fast track train um, young graduates into C C class licenses so that they could uh, actually take on management responsibilities within BA for maintenance. A better title for the for the course really would have been aircraft maintenance engineering Mm -hmm. in as far as. Uh, we did do some design and structural loading and so on, but we also did an awful lot on logistics and queuing theory and a lot more about the systems that you find on aircraft. And from a risk perspective, certainly about redundancy and resilience of aircraft systems and so on. So by the time we got out, it was ideally suited for indeed you know what, what my first job was, which was being a junior engineer officer on a Chinook squadron, number seven squadron, operating out of RAF Odium, uh, still does, mm-hmm. um, and with 12, 12 aircraft. And as I say, every day you look, lo- well, the aircrew, lo- you prepare them, the aircrew launch them, come back with various faults and so on. You fix them, carry out scheduled maintenance activity mm-hmm. and wheel them out again the next day, ready to go flying right, in very yeah. simple terms. Was there quite quite a lot of pressure in that? Um, it never felt as if you were pressurised, but the reality is, it's funny really. Firstly, engineering is a team sport, so you had to get the whole team working, uh, you know, to try and win. And when I say win, uh, every RAF station often ha- a typical RAF station has a number of flying squadrons, and the competition that exists between them to indeed meet the flying program to meet the serviceability targets actually we almost build our own pressure so you don't you don't feel the pressure you you actually just are enthused by it and Mm. want your squadron to be the best flying outfit on that particular raf station if you can do it within the group or within the actual overall service well what a wonderful place to be yeah so like a a positive competitiveness Uh, absolutely absolutely no definitely yeah no I I agree I think there's always everybody even internally within the team competing to to be the best was something that drove me personally along um I'd always look at the next electrician or engineer who was above me saying right okay this is what they do well what skills can I learn and um develop and I think that that is the that's the nice way of doing it is to actually see what it is that you are good and not so good at and focus on the areas where you're not so good and just work harder at them. Uh, again, um, you know, that there are many people that are despised for stepping on people and, you know, being riding roughshod over others to to achieve their own personal goals. In my own personal experience, that that really never works. Mm. Actually, what you've got to do is you've got to really try and be a team player within a very strong team and try and work out how you can make that team stronger. Sometimes it's by your actions uh, of actually encouraging others. uh, And certainly uh, many, much of the time, it's actually just being better yourself. Yeah, definitely. So obviously you've you've had quite an expansive career. What were what were some of the the biggest engineering challenges that you faced during your time with the RAF? Well, I think if I look and see, you know, what were the most enjoyable jobs that I've ever had, it was probably pretty early on. I was a, I, I spoke about being a junior engineer officer on a squadron. Uh, the pinnacle of being a squadron life is being the senior engineer officer mm-hmm. on a squadron at the squadron leader rank, typically. And I did that again on another Chinook CH-47 squadron, uh, 18 squadron. And at that time, we were working out of West Germany um, because this was pre-Cold War. In fact, the Cold War had just finished. So I went into that tour in 1990. And being 
feeling as if you are the ultimate responsibility for what's going on on engineering is quite a big responsibility um, for uh, anyone going into it. I, I was uh, lucky enough to be still pretty young. I was only 28 years old. I think I was the youngest squadron leader engineer in the Air Force at the time. So there were, felt as if there was a high degree of expectation. The reality is of just going in at that time, of course, we were also preparing to go off to the Gulf War. And in about two months after my arrival, we actually did deploy uh, to Saudi Arabia to take part in the coalition forces in Gulf War One, to uh, clearly uh, manage to get, you know, Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait and to liberate Kuwait. So that was, you know, um, when I look back, a massive task, and indeed one that um, I'm not sure I felt as prepared for as I might have done if indeed I'd thought more about it and perhaps had a bit more experience under my belt. But ultimately, it went well uh, using one's instinct uh, as to what to do in that situation, um, how to manage the resources, uh, the, the hard resources and the soft resources. The most important are always the soft resources, the people. Yeah. Yeah. So I had the ultimate joy of working with about 150 ground crew um, and as I've already mentioned, engineering is a team sport and everybody's got to, you know, I always liken it to a football team. You've got a different number on your back. You can't do all that you can't do. I can't be in goal. I'm yeah. not very good at not very good being a forward. I'm somewhere in the midfield. I'm kind of pulling and pushing at the same time. And you rely on your specialists who do all of the hard work. And indeed, in my experience, you know, you could not come across a more committed and highly trained group of women and men technicians to work with than mm -hmm. those that I've had the pleasure of doing so within the Royal Air Force. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we train very well indeed. We give people a lot of opportunity to really, um, uh, you know, to grow in those roles and to move quite quickly and people take on that responsibility. It's, um, it's wonderful to see. The other job that I would say is that, um, and what kept me in, I suppose, was because you could think actually having done that job at that age, why, why on earth did I stay in for as long? And I guess it's trying to take that experience and make it better, make the systems better. And I was involved in some serious level transformational activity in the um, uh, as an Air Commodore and then again as an Air Vice Marshal when we were trying to reorganize how we do things from an engineering perspective really quite dramatically, lose quite a lot of numbers in light blue uniform, take on board um, the, the contractors to undertake that work, the BASs, the Boeings of this world, which had never actually worked alongside us on the aircraft ever before. So that was very new way of doing things. It was about efficiency. Um, that's what we had to do. We had to achieve very high financial targets. Uh, the risk that we had is that we'd lose resilience, that we'd lose um, the skill sets that we had always been proud of having ourselves and that we wouldn't be as good in the long term. The, the reality is I think we've uh, got through all of those challenges. We've made sufficient savings uh, to keep frontline squadrons in place that otherwise would have had to have been lost because of the savings. Um, but we've also managed, I think, a far more mature and far better approach where the military do those things which we're good at, which is the deploy, move fast, frontline, sharp end, and relying on contractors who are historically, traditionally longer in the post, uh, have much more experience than indeed some of the young, young technicians out on the squadrons and can actually blend the overall experience and the workforce together so that ultimately the organization benefits from the young thrusters and industry working much more closely together. And, you know, that none of that happened easily. None of mm. that happened certainly by accident. And um, I was engaged in that twice to um, in, in three or four chunk year chunks to lead that work and to hopefully get a better overall outcome for defense. I believe we did. I believe that we've learned a lot of lessons. And indeed, at the time, I know a number of countries, a number of international partners thought that we were a bit mad, actually, in taking up uh, that stance and giving responsibility in a much more wholesome way to industry. But looking back, 
it's interesting how many of them having fo indeed followed the journey that we undertook because uh, defense and engineering and equipment is an expensive business you know what makes it expensive we're buying the high-end technology in very small numbers mm -hmm. you know even f-35 if indeed 3200 of these things are made i mean that's an awesome number of military aircraft but the reality is it's only 3200 yeah you know a car company would not produce computer chips for that small number you know they wouldn't even get out of bed to think about it yeah you know they're in the millions and therefore the overall cost per unit is so much higher and indeed you know with some aircraft that we're buying and aren't in the three thousands they're in a small handful so the royal air force at the moment is in the business of buying wedge tail the new early warning airborne air traffic control mission command aircraft and we're buying three <laughs> and <clears throat> they are incredibly high tech with you know incredibly high tech components and they are bespoke and therefore it's an expensive business to get in and if you want that leading edge technology then the only way you can do it is to you know balance your books find yourself some affordability and go and buy it and clearly contract for it as well as one can yeah investment is always key isn't it yeah um i think one of the other key things that you kind of mentioned was was discipline and um how, how did you find you suited the raf life in, in that aspect of things and i suppose once you you know were promoted to senior ranks you know then handing out the discipline and, and managing a team in that sense yeah i mean I, we shouldn't make too much of the word i don't think it i don't think it has a capital d um, I think, um, you know, the the culture has changed over the years. And I think certainly when I joined, um, it was pretty clear as a junior officer, you were a flight commander and discipline was something that, you know, was a bit more frequent. And it sounds dreadful. I mean, it wasn't as if at that stage anyone was going to prison, but you <laughs> would have the ability to uh, certainly to for a small fine. Um, a small 25 pound fine or something or you could give people extra duties it could be working this particular weekend to do a particular thing uh, therefore it was an inconvenience in many respects but of course the, mm. the you know the misdemeanors were relatively minor um, later on uh, are people still court-martialed uh, is there still an air force act um, yes there still are these um, these these things that can happen but these are much rarer these days and often for far more serious offences when, in fact, if it were of a particular uh, uh, severe, well, severity, then actually the law outside would take it, would kick in and take over. Um, and there's much greater oversight by what is going on now from outside looking into the military um, and, and quite rightly so. I mean, the, you know, law these days is so much more complicated and people's expectations of um, of how things will work are very different to they were 40 odd years ago. I mean, one of one of the more positive things um, that I uh, noted about yourself was that you be eventually became the defence engineering champion. Uh, yes, I did. Um, so uh, through my journey, as it were, of being in the Royal Air Force, one of the jobs that I did was being the station commander RAF Cosford. Now that particular unit just uh, just outside Wolverhampton is the RAF Technical Training College. At that time, we had two and a half thousand trainees going through. Um, it, yeah, really large number. The Air Force was a bit bigger in those days. Um, and we also um, had 900 civilians uh, working. A large number of those were, were lecturers alongside um, about 500 military lecturers. So it was quite a large number of people. But nonetheless, what I learned there was something which, well, I realized whilst I was there, the importance of professional and personal development. Mm. I mean, I'd already started doing some courses of my own to try and educate myself so that in the way that you discussed earlier, when one looks around, I could hopefully be a little better at my job. Mm. Uh, so I'd already undertaken an MBA at that particular point uh, to try and learn more about the business side of what we did within defense as well as engineering but the but what i really learned there was crystallizing the importance of um, of qualifications be to be given to all of the people that we trained uh, for as 
for nobody almost to do anything that wasn't accredited in some way, shape or fashion to ensure that people were building up a portfolio of evidence so that when they left the, the Royal Air Force and got a job outside, that transition would be as smooth as practicable and that the, the UK PLC, as it were, can actually make use of the skills that they had invested in uh, through paying their taxes, as it were, directly into the private sector so that aircraft technicians could go and be aircraft technicians in outside world, as it were, rather than mm. finding the barrier too great because they weren't qualified in the right to, in the right things. So that I really got got um, professional development. And then in another job a bit later on, probably looking back now about 14 or so years ago, from now, so in 2008, 2009, I was in a position where actually I was able to influence what we did as policy for within the RAF engineer branch. And it was to say we should start to seek professional registration as a norm mm. and start to uh, get, you know, start to become incorporated engineers, start to become chartered engineers. I'll come back to engineer technician in a moment. Sure. But those were the drives for the engineer officers. And also it was at a time when we were expecting, and indeed it then happened, that we, that a regulatory environment in which we were working within the military was going to step up a gear or two, and there likely was going to be a requirement for people in certain jobs who were making engineering and professional judgment to be professionally registered, mm. to be qualified. And the, the, you know, the, the gold standard was going to be chartered engineer. So I started uh, to try and push the Royal Air Force into this and was starting to be successful, working alongside some of the professional engineering institutions. I then got posted down to the location that I'd spent my last eight years, which is the an organization called the Defense Equipment and Support, which is the organization that does all of the acquisition and support contracts with industry for everything that the Ministry of Defense needs for, for aircraft, and for all of its weapon systems. So I did a job where I led on aircraft. There was another one of me that led on uh, ships. There was another organization that did something for submarines. There was another organization that did something for tanks and rifles, mm. and another one who did something for all the bits that were common to all of us, as it were. And uh, whilst I was there, I, to start with, my first job, I was the technical director. And again, I started to try and encourage the engineering workforce there to up their game in terms of professional development. And I'd made a bit of a name for myself, sticking my head over the parapet and just driving that forwards. A few years later in 2014, um, the uh, Defence Board was just about to go into a defence review and the Vice Chief of Defence Staff at the time uh, asked for a review to be undertaken as to what were the critical professions across the Ministry of Defence that we were having a problem either first recruiting, uh, training once they were in, and then most importantly retaining them. So we were losing experience levels quite quickly. And engineering, funny old thing, uh, mm -hmm. came out as one of those. And the Defence Board took the paper and said, right, engineering, we're going to run a trial we're going to appoint a defense engineering champion. We're going to give that person some resource, a few people, to see if they can make a difference as to how we go about our attraction, getting people in, and then the retention part mm -hmm. and the qualifications in between. And because I'd made a bit of a name for myself down in the DNS trying to push hard on all of those activities, I was selected by name to undertake this job, this role. So it was a secondary duty. It wasn't my full time job. Yeah. My full time job was being the technical director. But the beauty and the joy was of actually having at one time six people assisting me. At times that six became one. And mm. I think we got it up to about three eventually. So on average, about three people who were spending their time full time, uh, clearly working with me in terms of direction. But we drafted together the first strategy for STEM engagement. Right. Um, so the MOD were almost had a, pos a position and a permissioning to actually engage some of its energy in an organized way uh, to undertake STEM activity and try and encourage the next generation of engineers to, mm -hmm. you know, to gather so that ultimately if the pool were bigger, then we could recruit the right number of people we wanted. We uh, did a whole bunch of different things. 
Uh, one of another strategy that we wrote was about professional development, again, encouraging this to happen. And then we also managed to get the financial business case through such that the military will pay or the armed forces will pay for military's professional fees. Right. OK. Um, uh, once they are registered, uh, we actually then the next year or about 18 months after that got to the next step where actually we would offer a small uh, remunerative bonus for people to become professionally registered mm. to, 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 to try and get the whole thing moving as it were and people to be encouraged in looking outside um, for you know the jobs that they would do in the future and hopefully become engineering technicians ICT technicians for the vast number of people that we have in the Royal Air, uh, well, across the, the whole of the military, whole of the armed forces, whole of the engineering community within the military, Ministry of Defence. There are 55,000 engineers and technicians in the Ministry of Defence. Mm. So it's an awful lot of people. Uh, and I became their professional head and set the policies on what we were trying to do. I mean, a huge amount of work, and I have to say, it was often done late at night and early in the morning. Uh, when indeed you know, the one's day, one's real work was kicking in, uh, taking all of the rest of the time. But one, when I look back, I would I actually what a wonderful opportunity to have mm. influenced the landscape of the engineering career within the Ministry of Defence um, in the way. And after five years, I was very proud that it didn't just disappear, but I handed it over uh, to another senior officer, this time in the Navy, uh, to take that forward, that responsibility. So yeah. it was something which, um, you know, it was an idea, a flash of an idea that I'm very proud the fact that it existed and still exists. Yeah. Um, I was only talking to a member of the en uh, defense engineering uh, champion team uh, just last week. I met him at an IET event and it was great to hear, you know, what they're up to these days and, you know, keeping it going. Yeah. So it, de it definitely did have a lot of success then during your time. Uh, it did. Um uh, like all things, I mean, you always look back and could it have been better? Yes. But ultimately winning the arguments of of actually getting engineers pay to be engineers. And mm. I say engineers and technicians, um, you know, that was that was a big uh, that was a big win, I have to say, uh, yeah. a personal satisfaction. But without a doubt, the right thing to do. The sums of money were never life changing, but they were always about trying to show that the engineers and technicians in the Ministry of Defence and the armed forces are valued mm. for what they do. And, um, you know, working in a public sector organisation, um, if we all wanted to be frightfully rich, we probably wouldn't have chosen that particular career path. But there is an awful lot of motivation that comes from the work that you do being valued. Yeah, no value is, is important to any business and structure, isn't it? I mean, that probably blends quite nicely into the IET. Um, yeah. And uh, I mean, obviously, you mentioned the, you're, you're president of the IET. Obviously, um, what, why why did you choose to, to do the role and apply or, or put yourself forward for the role? Right. Um, well, it kind of happened. Um, it was something along the same lines of at the time that I was promoting professional development back in 2008, 2009, I realized, um, you know, what what the professional engineering institutions were. And I started to have conversations with them as to how they could help us um, get our military folk uh, interested and also ready for professional registration. And the IET at the time was the one that lent in the most and gave me the most help and assistance. Mm -hmm. And so I lent in, I suppose, more to the IET. I accepted the an offer to join one of their boards. It happened to be the Membership and Professional Development Board, quite logically from the rest of the conversation you and yeah. I have had, uh, Gary. Uh, that um, uh, So I joined that board and, and, and I joined it because I thought I wanted to learn more about it so I could be better at my job actually within the military and I could help more um, military people become professionally registered. Um, at the same time, clearly, they were getting an enthusiast and a volunteer to help them on the board. So I sat on the on that board for about four years or so from memory, uh, learning more and hopefully applying that within the um, back into the MOD and hopefully the IET got something out of it as well. I'm sure it did yeah. uh, to the point where um, and I can't remember quite who asked me now, but I was asked, would I like to stand for election to be a trustee for the for the board of trustees for the IET? And I thought, well, 
it's an interesting opportunity. I'll I'll do that. Although I didn't fancy the idea of the election much. Yeah. Um, I can't remember ever being elected to do anything, <laughs> as it were. Um, interviewed a few times and you know won the competition, but not actually uh, ever being elected. So mm. I put my uh, short words together as to what it was that you know I was excited about in engineering, and I was lucky enough to have been elected to join the board of trustees in 2016, um, and then you know learned an awful lot by being on the board of trustees. Uh, again, about how the IET works, its relationship with the Engineering Council, its relationship with the uh, Royal Academy of Engineering and, the, uh, and clearly the sister PEIs and industry and the others, all of the other players, as it were, to so how does this work? And I could try and again learn from that and also contribute clearly from a military perspective, but also from a just, you know, I'm gaining general knowledge at this point as well. Um, I'd been there for a couple of years and then asked if indeed whether I'd like to stand for election to be a vice president. Um, so uh, I'd, again, I didn't much like the sound of the election bit, uh, but by then I thought, well, I'll give it a go. So yeah. I wrote my piece, did a short video piece to camera, I think, which you were allowed to do in those days. There was no lobbying. You couldn't, no, right. couldn't it was no advertising or anything. That, that was the entirety of it. Um, and then um, I found myself, you know, a, a newly uh, elected uh, vice president. Again, after about a year, I suppose, I was then asked uh, summer of 2018 as to whether I would stand, whether I would like to be, I didn't have to stand for election at this point. This was a kind of decision that the, uh, I don't know, the, the smoke filled rooms, not that those <laughs> exist anymore, but yeah. the hierarchy of the, of the IET board of trustees, along with the executive, said you know would you like to become a deputy president and by being a deputy president means you you do two years as the deputy president the junior deputy president and the senior deputy president and if all still works well and you're still got the time in your diary to be able to do this you then stand you then become the president so mm. it i never chose to do it i kind of fell into it evolved um, <laughs> evolved absolutely you kind of got involved you know increasingly the good thing about the, the way that the PI, the IET works, as I'm sure many other organizations of this kind, is that, again, through that period, you took on additional responsibilities of particular committees where you would all work in groups and you chair it or be a member of it. So you started to learn an awful lot more about how the IET works. Um, so I chaired the investment and finance uh, committee for a couple of years. I sat on the risk committee. Uh, for a couple of years, I chaired the Technician and Apprentice Awards panel. I sat on the awards and prize panel. Mm. I sat on a couple of working groups uh, to do a couple of uh, tasks to see an IT system into fruition. So you learn an awful lot and you clearly hopefully bring something back from your day to day job and experience that's of value to the uh, to the IT as well. Mm. And um, you learn a lot from it, from doing it. And indeed, I would certainly say you know, less so perhaps for me, though, I, I would still claim to learn something new every day. But for some of the younger uh, trustees on the board, this could be quite a lot of experience of sitting on a board at that level, mm -hmm. of actually being a member of another committee or maybe chairing something or a working group is great experience that they can then feed straight back into their day to day professional life. And so I think that there are benefits that go both ways. As it is, um, I, you know, held down a busy job within the Ministry of Defence at the same time. Uh, but this was something that by and large often was done. You know, the, the boards of trustee meetings start at five o'clock in the evening or the yeah. afternoon, should I say, and run through till 7.30, 7.45. So it wasn't in core working hours. And clearly one made the time up, whatever one did in, you know, later on in the in the day, whenever. I mean, the day is a long day. Yeah. Uh, for anybody in, in any, well, in, in many walks of life, it certainly was for me uh, as a senior member of the senior member of the Royal Air Force. No, no yeah, no, I can imagine they're very long days, early starts, uh, late finishes. I, you so. know, <laughs> uh, that's not complaining. Uh, that's just a fact of life. And No, and I, I think, that, to, be, to be fair, I, th I think most engineers do have that, tip, you know, so, sort of diary and lifestyle. Um, to, certainly the day to day electricians that, you know, that will, that will be listening will be the ones um starting early in the day getting the you know electricity on and the last one setting and fixing well into the evening with the with the late summers <laughs> so yeah and it and it's funny i think that often 
for people who are, you know, the will it, the willing volunteers are often those that end up, uh, you know, taking on quite a lot of workload. But, yeah. um, you know, I would say happy to do so because, you know, genuinely wanted to make a difference at work and wanted to make a difference within the engineering community. And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, a small amount of you know, movement made. Yeah, that no, definitely. Is, is all good. I mean, you spoke you spoke obviously quite at, quite at length about professional development. Is is that part of any of your goals in, during your term as as president? Um, what what are some of the aspirations you have? Um, well, there was a couple of things. Uh, firstly, we had as a board of trustees for the previous uh, probably best part of eighteen months had been actually developing uh, a new strategy which we call IET Strategy 2030. Uh, with some with some particular themes and some particular societal challenges that we wanted to make a difference in. And that was published uh, for the first time, uh, coincided actually with me becoming president. So I've spent quite a bit of time promoting the strategy, explaining what it is and describing how everybody can actually join in and contribute towards the overall strategy. And hopefully in a more joined up way, we can achieve more in a joined up way mm. within the IET, we can go further and faster by actually focusing in on some key topics rather than perhaps at times being as broad as we had been in the past. Mm. Um, as we all know, if you, you know, if you want to concentrate effort and get things done, then then you probably need to come up with four or five things to do rather than a couple of dozen. Yeah. And so that's the that's the way the strategy was intended to try and coalesce energy on a fewer but most more importantly very strategic topics the second thing uh that i wanted to make a difference on was and i mentioned it a few times but technicians you know as far as i think the pei's for a number of years had focused more of its energy more of their energy on gaining incorporated and chartered engineers where indeed the reality is they're they 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 certainly exist in their tens and hundreds of thousands, but technicians exist across this country in their millions, and we had not really put our arms out and tried to encourage them to become professionally registered as engineering technicians or as ICT technicians, mm -hmm. um, as per the UK spec of the Engineering Council. And so it gives me great pleasure to to know that actually we're putting together now a value proposition so we can, um, you know, focus more cleverly uh, at what indeed technicians would want from membership from a PEI such as our such as ourselves. Uh, what kind of continual professional development will make the difference to them wanting to get that competitive edge that you and I spoke about, Gary, earlier? Yeah. Uh, you know, we both spoke about, you know, gaining better skills at what we did where we knew that we weren't quite so good to hopefully become better and to be more competitive uh, in the future for our career, for the benefit of our careers, benefit of our organization and just job satisfaction, really. Yeah. yeah at the definitely. end of the day. Um, so that's good. I never expected a focus on technicians to be an instant win. Never expected the numbers to go up in year. But we're putting a plan together such that um, I think that will be the case in the next two or three years. And, um, you know, I think there are other activities that are going on with regard to um, building regulations such as, um, you know, Dame Judith Hackett's uh, independent review, where there's a greater level of focus being being uh, shone, as it were, on the work of technicians and mechanics on the actual day to day doing the job. Mm. Um, and recognizing that post Grenfell, you know, the most dreadful tragedy, 72 people died just over five years ago now. And still we haven't learned all of the lessons that one hopes that we might that will stop a dreadful thing like that ever happening again in the future. And I think a lot of that will come down to the increasing levels of professionalization of a very large workforce. And that is a really, mm. really difficult thing to do. But, you know, I, it gives me great pleasure, a great kick, actually, when I hear people now within the IET, they talk about engineers and technicians. Mm. Uh, and, you know, we are it's now in our thinking. That's great. We've still got some action to actually do and to deliver more 
that's going to be a benefit of um, current and hopefully anticipated re, you know, a lot of future members in technician um, in the technical area. Uh, but it's, you know, if we don't start, we'll never get there. Yeah, no, definitely. Obviously, that that report highlighted um, collaboration amongst trades being one of the did. one of the key points. So, what are some of the things the the IET are doing to to further that aspect of the report? Well, the I mean, the her report, Jane, uh, Dame Judith's report, spoke about the need for all of the professional engineering institutions to collaborate with with industry and across trades, um, and indeed. Whilst we have a confusing picture, I think, in the UK, where we have in excess of 36, 37 professional engineering institutions carrying clearly the skills and wishes of some quite small groups and some very large ones across that, uh, there's always more that we can do to collaborate with each other. The reality is I don't see it as a massively competitive market where some people are in a particular niche and are clearly serving their members successfully and well. And all of us want to do that. Um, there are some which are bigger than others. The IET happens to be the biggest of all of the PEIs in uh, the UK, happens to be the biggest PEI actually in Europe with 155,000 members over 148 countries. But that's where I think that we have the opportunity to, to look broader and to try and bring people on board with uh, you know trying to worry more about professional registrations uh, so for example you're interested in electricians mm -hmm. you know so we already work with the JIB who issue the site competence cards for electricians uh, we're arranging further meetings with them it's a continual dialogue to ensure that all of the card card holders have a pathway to registration with the IET now, the IET is multidisciplinary, and that's why it's so big as it is, but its roots are strongly in electrical and electronic engineering. And so there is a natural uh, group of skill sets and subject matter expertise that already exists within the IET. And so um, working hard, really, with, with, the, with, the, with industry, and most importantly, all of the people and the PIs to deliver you know, step in professional um, knowledge, professional qualifications that are required mm. when we look at high risk and safety environments uh, within the building trade. I mean, one of one of the kind of key issues um, that regularly kind of gets brought up on, I'll say, on social media and, and regularly discussed by electricians is, is obviously short courses um, in, into the industry. I don't know if you've had any thoughts on that or if, if the IET are taking any steps relating to yeah. those. So, I mean, there's already a very wide range of providers uh, that are giving uh, offering short electrical courses. And we've looked at, um, I mean, again, we've got uh, various policy panels. We've got clearly a very large number of sub subject matter experts who of their own volition uh, have actually looked at various courses, perhaps been on various courses and then actually fed it into us through the various uh, social media blogs and opportunities that exist via our website. And some of those courses, I think we look and see are very successful indeed. And indeed, you know, we're not going to try and compete with those. If that if they're working well, then that's fine. However, it would be fair to say that other short courses don't appear to factor in all of the practical needs uh, for the industry, uh, which we then can, I think we can conf confidently say we are representing. Um, and that's where, you know, so a lot of the courses are, I mean, uh, colloquially known as, you know, five day sparky courses. Yeah. You know, you've got to do your course and then, you know, you'll be you'll have a license to operate. The reality is those courses have got to be good. They've actually got to keep up with the wire and regulations. They've actually got to keep up with legislation. They need to be updated on a frequent basis. And on some of them, we've seen that isn't the case. And so on many of those, we will be and are developing courses of our own to try and fit, fill that market, uh, recognising that, again, as a professional engineering institution, we are obligated to provide opportunities for our members to gain continued professional development. And, and clearly, we want to provide continued professional development, CPD, that's relevant to yeah. our members. 
And so if it's relevant to industry and it's relevant to a whole trade, then so much the better, because it means people are going to want to do it because they are going to get better at doing their job and will be better qualified. And, and ultimately, depending on the way that government policy goes, they, they may need a formal license to operate. They may need to be formally professionally registered. Mm. That could be the outcome. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we are trying to prepare, as it were, ourselves so that we can offer a professional service to all of our members so that if that is the outcome or even if, in fact, it's the direction of travel, that at least we are helping people get to where they need to be so that ultimately the work they undertake is done to the very latest standards and to a high quality. And it's yeah. not just a great big race for the bottom line. Yeah. You know, the cheapest is always going to win. As we know, the cheapest always winning brings safety concerns. Yeah, no, definitely. No, I mean, obviously, throughout the pandemic, we saw the, the increase of uh, webinars and, and CBD. So I think definitely it's opened lots of people's eyes who naturally may not have been drawn into, um, you know, CPD from home and, and things like that. So, you know, it's great to hear that obviously the IET are expanding on this and, and running with the ball on that one. Certainly, that's the aim. So in terms, we kind of touched on it a little bit, but what can the IET do maybe better to reach non-members as it stands? Um, well, that's a really good point. Uh, I think, you know, if you look back at the strategy, um, we've got some societal challenges which we've identified. There are five of them, but there are two that I really focus on because they are our priorities. And the first one is sustainability and climate change. Mm -hmm. Uh, which you know is the biggest problem this planet has ever faced. Yeah. Um, you know our planet needs to be fixed, and ultimately, who's going to fix it? Well, people's behaviours is going to be you know a big change uh, to the outcome in terms of temperature growth. But at the same time, it's going to be engineers that get hold of good ideas that have been put forward by scientists, mm. and ultimately, you know, you're going to need to produce it faster. It needs to be produced quickly. It need, needs to work better. And what are we good at doing? We're good at doing all of those things. We, we're great at continual improvement. Yeah. You know, we are a restless community that's never happy with what we've got. We always want it to be better, and therefore, you know, if we look at um, sustainability and climate change, what any technically minded person out there cannot believe that that is an important thing for the likes of any professional engineering institution to be engaged in and to be involved with. And thus, if we fly that particular kite and actually prove that we are making a difference, I'd like to think that we will encourage people to be more curious about us and hopefully join forces with us. The second of those societal challenges, again, which is absolutely a given, is di our digital future. Mm. Everything is changing. Every, you know, everything we touch, everything, the way we go about our work, everything is becoming digitalized. And therefore, what we've got to do is, is embrace it and try and move as fast as we can with that tech, that level of technology that's moving so very quickly. And if we think about it traditionally, if you think about professional development, you know, I, I could, you know, we gave great training, we give good training currently to all members of the military across, uh, you know, across across technical trades. So they all get some great good, great training. But if that's the last piece of training they're going to have for 20 years, their their skills will become irrelevant yeah. within about 10 years because they just can't keep up with technology. We'll be bringing in new equipment such as the F-35, which is an entirely digital monster. That if you don't know, you know, the rudiments of software and architecture and how it can work and most importantly, how we keep things safe and the importance of software um, uh, you know, updates, make sure that everything uh, fits alongside and is compatible with everything else, all of the other software loads that have been put onto the aircraft, uh, then, you know, we need to do that. And what that means is it comes all the way back to continual professional development. We need to give people technology refreshes mm -hmm. and to upgrade people's knowledge throughout their careers. And indeed, I think, again, for people who are out there in the sort of late 30s, mid, you know, to mid 40s, it's almost you could almost argue a neglected middle group of people that really do need to look hard at their own skills. And those people are certainly 
uh, if they're not already, should be beating a path to their professional engineering institution of choice or indeed think about joining one so they can gain access to further training that they need if it's not available through their place of work. No, definitely. Yeah, I mean, just being being a member obviously can create an awareness, can't it? And you yeah, don't know what you don't know. And an expectation. So as soon as you are professionally registered, again, the requirements of the Engineering Council are that you'll do 30 hours of CPD a year. Now, you know, that's not hard work. Um, I do a lot of my CPD listening to podcasts such as this on an engineering topic whilst I'm out walking the dog. Yeah. So it's not something, you know, you're just listening to something really interesting and gaining an appreciation for a different aspect of engineering that you knew nothing about and have learned something. And the dog gets a walk at the same time. Yeah. And it's like a win win, really. Yeah, no, I'm saying I'm saying here. I always have a, a podcast or two while I'm driving somewhere. It kills the time very quickly, doesn't it? And yeah. You fill your time in. Um, I mean, one of the things you kind of mentioned as well, I think it's probably worth just touching on. We've got. Um, a large amount of financial uncertainty as well. Is there anything like the IET uh, is looking towards in terms of uh, membership and and how that can be managed with members at the moment and trying to draw people in? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. I mean, over COVID, our overall, I mean, whilst we've got a very large number of members, uh, the overall membership number has in fact dropped. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that, but the principal reason is students not being either not being at university or for us not having access to university students right. to encourage them right at the beginning of their engineering career journey. That indeed, you know, they need it would be very valuable to become a student member of any of the professional engineering institutions to start to think about their qualifications. And actually, again, just get a broader understanding of what's going on within their profession. It's going to help them uh, and, it, you know, help them be, be more successful in the future. Um, so we are working hard now to try and recover that ground with students who are now possibly year two or year three. So we're working hard on that and you know, we're coming up to the, you know, to the strongest part of the year to do that in mm -hmm. October. Um, with freshest fares and all of what goes on there's a there's a it's not all again it's not all fun and yeah. drinking <laughs> yeah. some of it is actually you know societies and actually learning more about what what you need as it were to uh, to safeguard your future career so we're working hard on all of that but at the same time we're also listening hard to what the members are saying and in particular our young professional members as to what it is that they thought they were going to get from the IET what is it they actually get and in some instances they get more of what they were expecting and that's great mm -hmm. and in some instances there's a you know there is a there's a gap there so we've had a volunteer survey which we undertake every year but we're really looking hard at the outcomes from that to put in place hopefully meaningful actions mm -hmm. that's going to make us more attractive to members wanting to join us and most importantly staying with us mm -hmm. but if we look to the not too distant future you know, I think the term institution is an odd kind of word for youngsters to get their heads around. Mm. And indeed, I think all of us need to look hard at the overall value, uh, member value, uh, value proposition to ensure that we are not not only are we providing training that can be relevant to them, that we remain relevant to our members. Yeah. And and, you know, it hasn't escaped our attention that, you know, society is moving on. And people are members of less organizations than perhaps they were in the past or indeed have a requirement for dipping in and dipping out again. Yeah. And so we are giving thought as to how we might change ourselves as we look to the future, as I say, to ensure that we provide what our members want and what our profession needs as well. Yeah, I think one of the things I'll probably I'll, I'll share it with you. But it's just a thought off the top of my head. That's always been one of my slight frustrations with the in particular, I suppose, career manager is that it would be great to have a, an app, something on the phone to be able to log as you go. Some, something like that. I know that probably logging and, and recording CPD is probably the, the hardest part of it rather than undertaking it necessarily. And may, maybe that's something um, that we we could look into. Yeah, no, it's a very fair point, Gary. Uh, you're not the first person that's uh, made that point, and I know that it is being looked at. So in the IET, we're pleased to have the uh, the tool career manager. 
yeah well it is an application but is in an application on a on a laptop or on a, on a pc it's not necessarily one that's uh, that can you know you can pick up your phone and use um we we've heard that we've heard that point and in fact it's uh I, I can't tell you it's going to happen, but I can tell you it's under strong consideration. No, yeah, no, that's fine because it, that would help me. <laughs> yeah, well, it, I, and you know, and and many others like you, where indeed, you know, the connectivity that we have with our phone, which is you know permanently bolted to our left hand or right hand, yeah. depending you know which way it is, um, is uh, it is of course going to make that easier. I mean, t- touching on it, we spoke about the future. What will the future hold for the IET? Um, well. I'd like to think that the strategy 2030 will place us in a good position. Um, the themes within it are funny old thing, you know, excellence in engineering, um, doing our best to make sure that the, uh, you know, an increasing number of high quality engineers and technicians come into the profession on an annual basis. And I've already touched on the societal challenges yeah. that we are trying to put, again, energy into. Uh, we'll continue to try and inspire the next generation through considerable amounts of money and effort that goes into STEM related activity. We also, again, will continue to work hard on making professional registration firstly um, you know, mean something, but at the same time, not make it easier to achieve. I mean, one of the things that we're very pleased with having worked with the Engineering Council on, it's taken some four years and COVID got in the way, but is of actually being able to undertake in China the professional registration interview in Mandarin. So that's quite a breakthrough. And now whilst it took quite a long time, uh, there were concerns about the potential lack of quality, the potential lack of auditability of such a process. But um, we've got over we've got over all of that. Um, some of it was, um, you know, a bit of uncertainty as to how it might work, and some was there was some there was some good argumentation about how that, uh, you know, potentially could cause, um, you know, some drops in standard and so on. We we can overcome all of those. So that's one mm. example of trying to make ourselves again comes back to a so it's an it's an awfully it's an awful word if you're not it, but we are trying to be more relevant to our members yeah. on a continual basis. No, I think I think that's, that's what's all you can really do, isn't it? Uh, well, we can work hard at it, and as I say, keep reviewing yeah. what you're doing and how successful it's been. And you know, the great thing that engineers are, as I've already mentioned, is we're great at continual improvement. No, yeah, I, I think that's probably a, a a good way to end the the podcast. I do have um, one final question for you, though. What okay. is your favourite movie? My favourite movie? Oh, Dead Easy, Local Hero. Local hero. That's not one I'm familiar with. You're not familiar. <laughs> um, it must have. It came out in the 1980s. I'm kind of guessing 1984. Right. It's a movie about a um, an oil development in the north of Scotland, and the the whole thing is about the clash between corporate business and a local community. That the corporate business in setting up a massive oil refinery and terminal was going to disrupt. And it was the bringing together of those two cultures. It is a bit of a comedy. Um, it is a bit of a cult film. Uh, please look it up on your phones. Yeah, uh, I you will. And yeah. All <laughs> listeners, if you've not seen it and you'll find it, I think you'll find it actually on a ready day to day basis somewhere on Netflix or on Amazon. Yeah. And if you've not seen it, whilst the the only fault it has is it doesn't it was pre mobile phone and we talked about those yeah. so an awful lot of the action goes on in a telephone box without being <laughs> a without spoiling the whole story yeah but it is a truly inspiring film right okay no that's brilliant I'll uh, I'll definitely give that a go so and um, who could want to do anything other than be a local hero yeah exactly we all want to be a hero <laughs> yeah thank you very much for your time it's been uh, much appreciated and a, and a great conversation with you gary thanks very much indeed and uh, thank you everyone for listening